This is Fred. Amazingly, he can clone himself. We'll call the second Fred, Fred II. As you can see, they're exactly alike. Fred likes to play baseball. And so does Fred II. Fred's a whiz at video games. Ditto for Fred II. Fred is an excellent student. And Fred II, hmm, I guess he's not an exact clone after all. How is it possible that two people so much alike in so many ways receive such different grades? Actually, it's not all that uncommon. Out of practically any group of students with similar abilities, some will get excellent grades, some will score somewhere in the middle, and some will probably have below average grades. There are many reasons, but among the most important is a difference in study habits. If you've seen the first program in this series, you already know that there's a pathway to good study habits that practically anyone can follow, and it's made up of a number of steps. Create a positive attitude. Form a partnership with your teacher. Set up your own special study place in a quiet, well-lit room with all your study materials within easy reach. And make and follow a study schedule. Now we're going to talk about the final three steps. Read with a system, listen actively, and take great notes. First, read with a system. As you probably already know, reading is an important cornerstone of success at school and often later in life, too. Much of the reading we do has one overall purpose, to obtain information. Because there may be so many words that make up that information, a lot of people find it helpful to use a system. It's called SQ3R. And for more than a half century, it's improved the reading skills of millions of people. SQ3R stands for Survey, Question, Read, Recite, and Review. When you survey, you look over a reading selection to find its main ideas. Surveying isn't difficult. All you do is read the titles, the headings, and the subheads, those bold-faced or italicized words that introduce a reading selection. Obviously, this selection is about the lands of Africa. If there's an introduction or a chapter review or summary, you should read them also as part of your survey because introductions and reviews also highlight main ideas. Now, after you've surveyed, it's time to start asking some questions. Questions that will serve as signposts to help you find the selection's main ideas. Later, when you read, you'll answer those questions. Many experts suggest you use the words who, what, when, where, why, and how, along with the text's headings and subheads, to form your questions. Here are some examples. A wealth of environments is a heading. Using it, your questions might be, what are those environments? Where are they located? Who lives in those environments? How do the environments affect their lives? And what kinds of plants are found in each environment? Once you've formulated your questions, look at the end of the chapter. Many texts have questions there also. They too can be used as signposts that point toward main ideas. In addition to acting as signposts, questions also keep your mind active as you read because you're actively trying to find their answers. More on that in a minute. But first, it's time to practice what you've just learned. Stop your VCR and complete exercise number two. After you've finished, you can start the tape again. Up to this point, we've discussed the first two steps of SQ3R, survey and question. Now we're going to move on to the three R's of the system, read, recite, and review. Keeping your mind active by answering the questions you've come up with, and those at the end of the chapter, is key to fully understanding and remembering what you read. Let's see, what are the environments found in Africa? Oh, there's the answer. Rainforests, grasslands, deserts, and mild coastal zones. That's the idea. 
Now, in addition to answering your questions as you read the text, you'll also find that studying maps, graphs, and charts, as well as pictures and their captions, will make your reading and learning experience much more complete. Moreover, you'll want to give words in bold-faced or italicized type special attention. Usually, these unfamiliar terms are defined in the text, and here's a tip for you. They have a way of popping up in tests. Now, here's another tip you may find useful. After you've read a small part of the selection, perhaps a long paragraph or several paragraphs set apart by a subhead, write a summary of it, including your definitions of unfamiliar words in boldface or italicized type. The important thing is to use your own words when writing your summary and definitions. Copying from the book is a waste of time because that doesn't require an active mind. And if your mind isn't active, you won't be learning. Words merely copied escape into Never Never Land. On the other hand, when you use your own words in your summary and definitions, the knowledge becomes your property. Now, at this point, you may be concerned that the SQ3R system will take a lot of time. Actually, it doesn't take that much longer than reading straight through. In the long run, however, you'll save time because you won't have to relearn everything when studying for your tests. Now you're ready for the next step in the SQ3R method. Recite. The environments in Africa are rainforests, deserts, grasslands, and mild coastal zones. The rainforests are found in West Central Africa near the equator. The main deserts are found in the north and south. When reciting, you answer the questions you've previously asked. Two main deserts are the Sahara and... and... At the same time, you can check for gaps in your knowledge, for information that for one reason or another didn't get into your memory bank. Of course, you fill in those gaps by referring to your notes or to your text. In either case, you'll want to jot down the information and recite it aloud to firmly implant it in your mind. The two main deserts are the Sahara in the north and the Kalahari, Kalahari, Kalahari in the south. Sahara, Kalahari. Now, remember those questions at the end of the chapter? Well, you'll want to answer them aloud, too, as part of your recitation. What are the two seasons that cover most of Africa? Huh. Let's see. Oh, I know. The two seasons that cover most of Africa are the rainy season and the dry season. At first, it may seem a little awkward talking to yourself, but after you do it several times, it'll become a natural part of your good study habits. Now we're ready for the last step in the SQ3R method, the review. To review, you simply look over the information once again, in the textbook and in your notes, all the while making certain that you understand everything. If you have class notes that cover the reading assignment, you should look at them, too. It's important to review while everything is still fresh in your mind. Reviewing immediately after reciting will help cement all the facts firmly in place. Now here's your chance to put into practice some of what we've just discussed. Stop your VCR now and complete worksheet number three. When you're finished, you can turn your VCR back on. The sixth step of good study habits is listening actively in class. Knowing how to actively listen to your teacher is extremely important because two-thirds of what we learn in school comes not through our eyes by reading, but through our ears. Okay, class, and I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. This section we hear, listen carefully, or some variation of it, all the time. But very seldom, if ever, does anyone tell us how. To understand how to listen well, it helps to know that the human brain works about four times faster than human lips, including those of your teacher. Which means there's lots of empty time for you to daydream, or to practice your artistic abilities, or to pass notes that detail the latest exploits of your classmates, or to do whatever. 
The thing of it is, however, once your mind has wandered off the path of active listening, there's no signal to tell it when to start paying attention again. And that can be disastrous. Gwen. 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 Are you paying attention? <laughs> To prevent disasters, it's a good idea to not let your mind wander in the first place. To keep your mind from wandering, you need to become an active listener. That's done by concentrating as hard as you can on what's being said and nothing else. That's the key, nothing else. Sure, it's easy for you to think about other things. Boy, I'm hungry. I wonder what's for lunch today. But whenever it happens, immediately refocus your attention back to the classroom. Otherwise, of course, you could miss something important. Now, tomorrow we have a test on nouns and pronouns. And I urge you to study pages 61 through 71. As with all the other skills we've mentioned, active listening needs to be practiced again and again in all your classes to become a habit. A few tricks also help. First, try to anticipate what the teacher is about to say. Let's take a look at some of the products that grow in this region. They're over here. Cocoa, bananas, plantains, and palm nuts. Plantains and palm nuts. You can make a game of it. A game you can be a champion of if you read your assignment before the class meets. That's our second tip. And here's a third. If you sit in the back, or near someone who disrupts your concentration, or near the windows and you're easily distracted, ask your teacher if you can sit near the front. With fewer distractions there, you'll probably be a better listener. It's time to stop your VCR now to complete worksheet number four, which helps you discover how much you've learned about listening. When you're done, turn your VCR back on. Now it's time to work on taking great notes, the last step in building good study habits. It's a skill you may not need right away, but eventually you will. To take great notes, you need some preparation. First, you'll need to come equipped with your tools of the trade, tools that teachers expect their students to bring to class, a pen or pencil, along with a spare or two, and plenty of paper. Next. Your reading assignment should be completed before coming to class because it's easier to pull out the main points of the teacher's presentation when you've already read about the topic. Yesterday we talked about how cells form tissues in plants and animals. Today we're going to look inside the cell at its most important structures. They're called organelles. Great notes start with the day's date and a title. Those two items will help you organize when you're ready to study for a test. Great Notes also use a format that allows you to write on one part of the page during class and a blank space you can use later to summarize and to make notations. The first organelle we're going to talk about today is the nucleus. Now, most cells have one nucleus, and it's encircled by a membrane that allows small particles to pass in and out. We say that's porous. Here's a good definition of a porous material. It's thin, small holes in it that allow materials to move in and out. Inside the nucleus are the nucleoli which are small structures, and this is where the genetic or hereditary information is made. Because speakers can speak faster than writers can write, words have to be abbreviated, and only the main ideas and their examples are jotted down. So how do you know what the main ideas are? Well, as we've mentioned, reading your text before class will certainly help. Most teachers will give you some clues, too. For instance, when they write something on the board, that's usually an indication that the material is important. If they say something like, there are a number of reasons for this, or there are three examples, 
they're about to give some specific information that goes with a main point. When your teachers repeat something, that's a sign of importance, too. And whenever they say, this is important, be sure to write this down, pay attention to this, and you'll be expected to know this, it's time to start writing. Now we're going to give you some practice taking notes. Turn off your VCR and get a pencil or pen, worksheet number five, and several sheets of notebook paper. Be sure to carefully read the instructions on the worksheet before you begin. Worksheet number five contains some notes on the cell organelle lecture you've just seen. Now we're going to see some more of the presentation. As you watch and listen, take your own notes. Afterwards, you'll be able to see how you've done. Ready? Here goes. Let's move out of the nucleus of the cell and into the cytoplasm, which is the gooey substance in which all the other organelles are found. Here is a ribosome. R I B O S O M E. Here's another ribosome. They're the little dots you can see throughout the cytoplasm. Now, the important thing to remember about ribosomes is that they are where the proteins are made. Now, you don't have to write this down, but proteins are made up of chemicals called amino acids. Of course, you remember from yesterday's lecture that cells are made of proteins. Okay? Now, let's move on to the endoplasmic reticulum. E N D O P L A S M I C R E T I C U L U M. You can think of it as a series of tunnels and channels through which many of the cell's materials are transported. It's an important structure that serves as a transportation system. Next. The Golgi apparatus, G-O-L-G-I-A-P-P-A-R-A-T-U-S. The Golgi apparatus is made up of uh, many membranes, and it is where proteins are stored and packaged for shipment to other cells. Sort of a, a warehouse for proteins. Here's a mitochondria. M-I-T-O-C-H-O-N-D-R-I-A. Some people call it the mighty mitochondria because this is where the cell's energy is manufactured. It's a cell's energy plant, and as you can see, there's more than one mitochondria per cell. The important thing here to remember is this is where the energy is made for the cell, the mitochondria. Now, plant cells have chloroplasts, C-H-L-O-R-O-P-L-A-S-T-S. -O -O the little dots inside here are called chlorophyll, C-H-L-O-R-O-P-H-Y-L. And they're what give plants their green color, and they're responsible for the process called photosynthesis, which, if you remember from Monday's lecture, is the method that plants use to convert sunlight into sugars, which is used for the plant's food. The organelle in which this process takes place is a chloroplast. The last organelle we're going to cover today is a vacuole. B a C U O L E. And it's a hollow space in which the cell's food and waters are stored. Stop your VCR once again and look at worksheet numbers 6 and 6A, which show an example of how the notes might have been taken by an accomplished note taker. 
Compare them to the notes you've just taken. Of course, your notes won't be exactly the same, but they should cover the main points of the presentation. Once you've made your comparisons, turn your VCR back on. Throughout the two parts of this presentation, you've been carefully guided through seven steps that form the basis of good study habits. We've given you a well-marked pathway to follow. Now, it's up to you. As we've said, habits have to be developed over time, and good study habits are no exception. Moreover, doing something new usually seems strange. We often have to force ourselves to do it. Generally, however, it's worth the effort. So if you want to do your best in school, stick with the plan through thick and thin, and eventually, you may have a very big payoff indeed.